Welcome to A Tech Stories. My name is Benjamin Vidwen Cloquet. I'm CEO and co-founder of EdTechX Holdings and partner at Ibis Capital. EdTechX Stories is a short weekly interaction with CEOs, founders, investors, and innovators shaping and making the future of education and work. So welcome to EdTechX Stories, and I hope you enjoy our next session. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anna Brailsford. I was actually born in Liverpool in 1986, which is one of the best decades on record. Um, I currently live in London, um, and I'm here to talk about Code First Girls. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm Bracey, part of the team at IBIS, and I'm so excited to be interviewing you today. So I'll start out with my first question. Um, is there a defining moment or a defining person in your life which inspired you to lead an education technology business? So my mom was actually an entrepreneur, um, which is a mixed blessing because on, like, on the one hand, you get a massive education when you're a teenager in things like how to read a P&L, how to build a product, um, but also you don't have many summer holidays. <laughs> so I used to come, uh, come back from university and um, work in the family business, um, which is a real sort of baptism of fire in some respects. So. I really respected my mum for building that business. It was an early education company. Um, but equally, you know, some of my very early bosses um, who've, who've been guys uh, have been absolutely fantastic. One in particular, um, who's the, the former MD and VP of Linz.com, uh, was really influential in my life in terms of sort of creating a role model uh, around business as well. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm somehow not surprised that entrepreneurship runs in the family. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about Code First Girls and what sets it apart from all the other ed tech businesses out there. So Code First Girls uh, have trained uh, around 70,000 uh, women um, to become software engineers, uh, full stack uh, data engineers and data scientists. And we have a super simple but very subversive philosophy, which is women receive their training absolutely uh, for free. Um, a lot of people say, well, how can you create a business? How can you run a business? Uh, it's a B2B subscription model. So uh, companies effectively pay um, for women to land their dream job and be skilled up for their dream job, specifically to take roles in their company. But we also have built-in ratios where in order to get that woman into a job, uh, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna say to companies, for the money that you give us, we're also gonna train X uh, amount of women in local communities in order to build out regional talent pools and a much greater sort of ecosystem to address um, the, the, the gap in, in getting more women into tech. It's incredible what you've built. And one of the things that has has set you apart for us from our perspective is how you've built this community despite being an online-led teaching environment. Could you tell me a little bit about how you have set about creating that community of women uh, within this online-led learning um, proposition that you've built? The best thing about creating a community, I think it is the best way to sell a product in, in, in this age. Uh, because it's a flywheel effect. 60% of everything that comes into Code First Girls is pure word of mouth. That's both women talking to other women saying, hey, you just got to check this out. Look at the job I landed. Look at the educational opportunities I've been given. Look at the most amazing women that I met on this course through this program. It's, it's highly emotional. Uh, educational is an emotional experience. And what we're trying to do at Code First Girls is to, to rally women around that and to say, actually, you're gonna get far more from this than just a technical education and a job. You're actually gonna create you know, emotional connections throughout the process. So that's the first thing we did. We said, look, community first and create a model that's built around women so that they can effectively come together and, and create connections. Um, the second thing that we did, coding has this um, perception, right? Where, where people are, are working to 4 a.m. at night on their own, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's a lonely activity. One of the things that we did um, from an early point was that we made it very social and very collaborative. 
So a lot of the um, early interventions that you have with Code First Girls are based on fun. And coding can be fun. Um, they're highly social and they're built around projects. So they're not necessarily built on things like hard coding tests. They're built around what can you create to solve a problem and how can you demonstrate the social impact that your solution might have to the world. Now, when you're talking about technology in that sense and education in that sense, do you know what? It's ubiquitous. It's much more fun to get involved in. Um, and we managed to convert far more women at an early stage in the process before we go on to the more kind of, you know, the serious coding education, which is linked to jobs. That's amazing how you've created something that's so interesting out of something that have such a different perception of. Could you tell me a little bit about how these projects work? Are they tailored to the B2B customer or to the employers? Uh, how do you personalize that? Um, they can be. Uh, it, it really is, depends on the project we're working on. So for example, with our uh, massive open online courses, it's super industry led. It's led by a particular partner. Um, for example, you know, the stuff that we've got coming up with Aston Martin and Formula One will take data points from Formula One cars, teach the women about AI and ML and get them to apply that to the data points from the cars so they can race their cars over the course of a couple of weeks and then we showcase the winners. So we're trying to take things that actually might be all around us, whether it's data points or you know, how quickly a car moves. And what we're trying to do with that information is to make it fun and to, to build um, solutions and build kind of um, products that has real world application. So that's the, the first thing we do. The second thing we do is we also deliberately pitch projects um, within our extended courses that usually have some level of social impact and something that's relevant to um, women. Um, so for example, things that are coming up at the moment, the cost of living crisis, building products and solutions around that. Uh, previously, we've had a lot of winners that have produced um, products around financial inclusion or um, products that could actually help prevent domestic violence. So there's, there's many ways that you can create um, that connection between women and technology by having um, projects within courses that you're ultimately leading towards that sort of outcome. It's very, very different in terms of the approach that we offer. Thanks, Anna, that's so interesting. And, and looking forward, what do the next five years look like for you and for Code First Girls? So we've grown dramatically um, over the past 18 months. We've, Code First Girls is 10 x um, We're now in several different countries. Um, we work on behalf of 100 companies now. Um, what we're trying to achieve over the next five years, or rather what we will achieve over the next five years, um, the growth trajectory we're on is to supply um, women with over a million different opportunities to get involved in coding education. And in terms of the women that we are aligning to our jobs in our portfolio, we want to create in excess of a billion pounds worth of economic opportunity for women entering the tech workforce through Code First Girls. So there are two um, goals over the next five years. Thanks, Anna. And in, a, in an environment where impact is the key word that's on everyone's mind, you know, I can see how Code First Girls presents such a valuable proposition in that environment. I'm going to move on to a very quick and fun section of rapid fire questions. So I have five quick questions for you that are either or, and I'll just shoot them at you rapid fire. Um, so the first one, profit or impact? Oh, God. <laughs> um, <clears throat> depends who you're asking, right? I mean, I'm always going to say impact because I think if you get impact right, profit will flow from that. Um, but if you lead with profit and you don't get the impact, I think your profits will dwindle. So my strategic answer to that is if you get impact right, you'll then get profit as a result. Students or shareholders? Oh, students. <laughs> That's an easy one. Because <laughs> like, if you don't have somebody that loves your product and at the end of the day, we're addressing a really unique supply and demand issue and the supply and demand issue is not enough women in tech. So um, the students and the women will always come first. And that is an absolute um, standout on behalf of our brand. And it has to remain so. Degree or skills? 
I'm going to say skills. Um, the reason for that is because we can take almost any degree discipline and convert it into the type of skills that we require in order for the women to get jobs, providing they have the aptitude to be able to do it. So I'm going to say skills um, because, yeah, we find degree disciplines quite fluid at Code First Girls. Dogs or cats? Dogs. That's no brain. And, <laughs> <laughs> and coffee or tea? Coffee. <laughs> so two things I have an addiction to, dogs and coffee. Um, I have two, do- two family dogs uh, and I have um, probably about six coffees a day uh, and very rarely drink tea. Well, you're an entrepreneur, so you need the coffee. It's understandable. And Anna, what are you learning right now? Um, so I've literally just come back from holiday, uh, and when I'm on holiday, it's a really unique opportunity for me to read, <laughs> read something that isn't about business, or read something that is completely different. Um, so I just read a book called Black Box uh, Thinking, um, and I found it super interesting while I was on holiday. I was actually thinking about how I could apply it to Code First Girls um, and, and what we do in, in the business. And what it does is it looks at uh, closed loops versus open loops um, and the type of thinking you can apply to your organization. Um, and it looks at the, 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 um, the aircraft investigation area and how they're so good at investigating something and then sharing data on a global level in order to learn from those mistakes. So really it's looking at things like um, failure and how important failure is in order to continuously iterate. But that ultimately depends on the culture around failure and how leaders address failure and whether they use it as a really fantastic opportunity to learn or whether they choose to cover it up. Um, so having read that book, I came back and I was like, wow, this is, this is a fantastic mentality to introduce to organizations to actually celebrate people disclosing things, learning from it and continuously iterating. Thanks so much for that, Anna. I think I need to go order that book. (laughs) Um, And the final question for you today, Anna, please would you nominate the next interviewee for EdTechX Stories and tell us why? He's going to hate me for this, but I'm going to nominate Matt Clifford, an entrepreneur first. He's got a massive following around tech and thinking differently about tech. Uh, He's just written a book and the book's called How to Be a Founder. And what they've tried to do is compress all of the learning they've had from uh, this massive portfolio of companies that they've created into the kind of the the key learnings and like narratives around how to be a founder. Um, So I think Matt would be a really interesting interviewee. Thank you so much for joining us for this EdTechX story. It's so great to learn from you and from your experience. Uh, So thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much.